All right, Jeremiah 12, of course, God is good. Let's call chapter 12 more because there are times in life when it's more better than you think and there are times when it's more bad than you think, meaning sometimes it's worse than you think and sometimes eh, it's better. In this chapter that the ESV, the English Standard Version, seems to do a good job of organizing on its own. So I'm going to stick with their organization and simply break their second section down into three sections or three, sorry, subsections. Understanding they've broken it down into a simple question and answer. Jeremiah asking God, why have you let it get this bad? And God answering, it's worse than you think. Before he actually says, eh, it may not be all bad because some parts may actually be better understanding that that first section contains Jeremiah's complaint in the first two verses. I'll just read at least part of it. Lord, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? You plant them and they take root. They grow and produce fruit. You are near in their mouth and far from their heart. A similar pattern to what we've seen all the way back through the earliest stages of the prophet Isaiah. Jeremiah is lamenting it again this many years later as he was going to say, but you, Lord, in verse three, you know me, you see me and test my heart toward you. As he is then in the second half of verse three and verse four, going to go ahead and pray for God or ask God to pluck up or uproot the wicked, understanding that he just got the bad news as to how much the drama actually involved him, understanding that no matter how bad he thought it was, it was worse than he thought, something that God is going to remind him of even more in this next section. Understanding that God is now going to answer from verse five or from verses five on through the end of the chapter. That first section of his answer in verses five and six devoted to Jeremiah. That second section seeming to be devoted to the people or the nation. And that third section seeming to be devoted to his answer or his response regarding the nations, the world in general. First of all, he's going to break the bad news to Jeremiah that if you have raced with men on foot and they have wearied you, how will you compete with horses? Understanding verse six is going to break the bad news. Even your brothers have dealt treacherously with you. They are in full cry after you. Do not believe them, even though they speak friendly words to you. The bad news having been given to Jeremiah that it's Worse than he thinks, that's the title. God's not going to turn his attention to the nations, saying, don't feel so bad because it's a similar situation for me. My paraphrase, verse seven, however, saying, I have forsaken my house. Why? Verse eight, for she has lifted up her voice against me. Therefore, I hate her. Strong words from God about his people Israel, as he will go on in verse 10 to talk about the role of the shepherds in the decline, as he is going to repeatedly say that they have specifically had a hand in the destruction of the people. My shepherds have destroyed my vineyard. They have trampled down my portion. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it a desolation. Therefore, the land mourns. Or it's going to say it mourns to him. The whole land is made desolate. However, it doesn't seem to be connecting with anyone. Going back to the days of Isaiah when they seemingly lost the ability to connect two plus two, their condition to uh, the things that they were doing. Jeremiah, like we said, all these years later, seems to find the people in the same circumstance, understanding that they're not making the connection between the desolation and their habits. Understanding that he's going to talk about the way that the land is now mourning as a derivative of the wrongs that the people have become committed to. Wrongs that verse 13 will let us know have attracted the fierce anger of the Lord. Verses 14 through the end of the chapter, though, giving us a bright side, understanding that even though he has, as he said before, used the nations to discipline his people, he is now going to talk about his evil neighbors, giving a ray of hope by saying in verse 16, and it shall come to pass if they, that's the neighbors, the evil neighbors, not his people, but if the evil neighbors will diligently learn the ways of my people to swear by my name as the Lord lives, even as they taught my people to swear by the Baals or by Baal, then they shall be built up in the midst of my people. But if any nation will not listen, then I will utterly pluck it up and destroy it, declares the Lord reminding me that the same rule he applied to his people, he's applying to the nations, helping me to realize once again why the Psalms 
seem to be like water in the way that they have the H2O effect, meaning they can get at us at a molecular level, dissecting the needs of the heart. It can be a crashing wave of conviction at the time we need it, sometimes against our enemies, but sometimes against us when we're doing wrong. But sometimes they're just a refreshing drink of water. And sometimes if you are in a position where you struggle to understand, like Jeremiah, why inequity or wickedness seems to thrive, a conclusion like this gives you relief when you realize that God has one standard for all people, no matter what you see around you helping us to see that the question may not really be, God, why do you allow wickedness to thrive for so long? As much as it will be, will we give up on the timing of God's justice? Which is why we sometimes say, my prayer for you is my prayer for me. May God give us the strength to be committed, diligently committed to his standards of justice so that we avoid attracting the hostile side of his judgment.